how did the Enlightenment impact historical scholarship on the Gospel of the Acts of John in the 1800s and the 1900s? As part of the apocryphal Acts of John, the Gospel of the Acts of John is an early Christian gospel that presents Jesus in a different manner from the canonical Gospel of John. In it, John speaks about his experience of Jesus' body in the first person, as in the following example. Sometimes, when I meant to hold Jesus, I encountered a material and solid body. But at other times, when I again touched him, the substance was immaterial and bodiless, and as if wholly non-existent. Unlike the fourth gospel, this gospel presents Jesus as having something other than a normal human body during his public ministry. Because of this, the Acts of John came under Orthodox bishop scrutiny, although it took a few centuries to attract conciliar notice specifically. In the year 787 CE, the Church held the Second Council of Nicaea. The primary issue discussed at the Council was the veneration of images. Some influential Christians, known as iconoclasts, were arguing against such veneration. They attempted to halt the practice altogether, and they reportedly used the GAJ as evidence for their view. Meanwhile, many other Christians condoned the veneration of images. The objective of the council was to decide and enforce an authoritative opinion on the matter. The council members read aloud portions of the Acts of John, including the above excerpt from the GAJ, which is what I call the Gospel of the Acts of John. So when I say GAJ, I'm just talking about the Gospel. And these council members determined that it contradicted apostolic teaching. And because it contradicted apostolic teaching, the iconoclasts who used it as authoritative evidence were basing their views on a heretical document. And if they were basing their views on a heretical document, then their iconoclastic doctrine was heresy. In the view of the council, then, the Apostle John never would have taught such a thing. As one of the bishops exclaimed, Perish the thought that St. John the Divine uttered anything contrary to his gospel. The council members' verdict followed shortly thereafter. No one is to have copies made, and we decree not only this, but also that it deserves to be consigned to the flames. Some modern readers might find the council's reasoning strange. If someone were to argue against the iconoclasts today, it would not be necessary to show how their quotations of the GAJ do not address the issue of image veneration at all making the text irrelevant to their argument. Instead, the council discredited the text by undercutting its purported connection to the Apostle John. This brings up an interesting question. What happened to change the way that people judge the authenticity of texts between the time of the Second Council of Nicaea and the modern period? The short answer is that the Enlightenment, a major intellectual movement between the medieval and modern periods, shifted the way in which uh, Western people interpreted texts, and especially religious texts. There has not yet been a sustained effort to frame the study of the GAJ within the wider conversation of how Enlightenment, uh, the Enlightenment shifted the interpretation of texts. Uh, So this present study, this little study that I have, attempts to give such a framing. It argues that 19th and 20th century scholarship on the GAJ reflected the influence of Enlightenment-era intellectual movements. To demonstrate this, the paper will have two parts. First, a survey of Enlightenment-era perspectives on religion and the Bible will frame the context in which the study of the GAJ arose. It explains how Enlightenment-era thought refocused the study of religious texts from confessional concerns to historical concerns, using the presumption that confessionalism could be sidestepped using historical criticism. The next uh, argument of the paper is that a sequence of modern scholarly treatments of the GAJ uh, can be shown to be fitting within or responding to this wider Enlightenment context. This part of the study argues that the academic literature of the GAJ has been dominated by historical criticism as an effort to reconstruct histories of the early church without defaulting to traditional narratives. Uh, This little study will also show how some of the authors whose religious affiliations can be ascertained, uh, whose religious affiliations can be ascertained, seem to accommodate the apparent tension between their work as historians and the confessions that they held as practicing believers. The first section of this essay claims uncontroversially 
that modern GAJ scholarship before the year 2000 is an offspring of the approach to history promoted by Enlightenment-era thought. To explain why that happened, this section will condense current scholarly understandings of the events into a three-step narrative, illustrating a significant shift in interpretation of religious texts between the pre-modern and modern periods. Highlighting the most representative issues and thinkers will frame the context in which the succeeding discussion of GAJ scholarship will make sense. The first step in this transition was to disconnect the hold of tradition upon knowledge production. As explained in the introduction, the pre-modern world saw the authenticity of a religious text, like the Gospel of John or the Acts of John, as tied to its doctrine. But with the Enlightenment, it became more important to judge the authenticity of a text based on the historicity of its contents, insofar as those contents could be ascertained by a uh, purportedly objective or empirical form of knowledge production. The Enlightenment movement encouraged the effort to produce secure knowledge that was independent of religious and especially Catholic tradition. After the wars of religion that followed the Protestant Reformation, intellectuals sought ways to understand religion and ethics in a way that could avoid future conflicts. The movements of empiricism and rationalism provided alternative means of knowledge production, the very means that they were seeking. Amid a sizable collection of English, French, and German philosophers, one of the most climactic thinkers was Immanuel Kant, who in 1793 attempted to develop a rationalistic account of religion that would ap apply across confessional lines. To do so, he split religion into universal parts and historical parts. The former could be discovered through reason alone and were absolute truths whereas the latter applied only within the contexts of existing historical traditions. A peaceful society would emphasize the former rather than the latter. The bulk of his work elucidated what he believed were the universal parts of religion, which included humans' uh, nature as moral beings, their contradictory inclinations toward good and evil, and the methods whereby evil can be defeated. To him, if everyone could agree on a rational basis for religion, then conflicts could be resolved. Underlying this was the idea that tradition provided inadequate grounds for secure knowledge production, especially in ethics. The next step was to find a way to narrate history, and especially religious history, apart from relying on tradition, that is church tradition. If the tradition could not be trusted to keep violence at bay, then why should it be trusted for its claims about the past? Thus, the Enlightenment helped to launch a new interest in historiography as a way to verify or refute particular historical narratives that were associated with religious traditions. In his late 17th century work, Tractatus Theologico Politicus, Spinoza was one of the first people to apply an early version of modern historical criticism to the Bible. This made him one of the founders of higher criticism, that is, the historical criticism of the Bible. Such criticism was more systematically developed, however, in Germany in the second half of the 1700s. Thanks to the Reformation, German Protestants had already inherited a suspicion of tradition when interpreting sacred texts. Being against all forms of papistry, they were entirely willing to question the interpretations set forth by the Catholic Church, and the study of history was one way to undercut the Catholics' interpretations. With the new emphasis on historiography, there were now two main goals deciding the historical meanings of texts, and judging the historical claims within the texts. An example of the latter was David Strauss's Life of Jesus, published from 1835 to 1836. Strauss tried to narrate Jesus' life from a historical perspective, without automatically deferring to any of the sequences or claims contained within the Gospels. One of the most important claims in his book was the idea that the miracles in the Gospels were mythical interpretations of the early Christians rather than actual events in Jesus' life. The work invited extensive criticism from those who believed in the factuality of the Gospels, but Strauss's work was an instance of the kind of historical arguments that would be required thenceforth of any scholar that hoped to be taken seriously as a historian. Third. The new interests and goals of biblical studies sparked inquiries into the wider world of early Christian literature, including the GAJ, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. If the tradition and the canon were no longer the authoritative sources to acquire historical truth about Jesus and the early Christians, then historians needed to procure as many reliable sources as possible to discover what happened. This source-based history was already being developed by Germans like Leopold von Ranke in the middle of the 1800s. He pioneered the critical use of varied documents for writing history. 
He is also credited with developing the seminar method of teaching history, which encouraged students to procure sources for themselves, produce studies, and discuss their findings collaboratively. Despite not always being connected with Ranke, the seminar method and source-based study eventually came to influence American seminary education in the last decades of the 19th century, although it occurred slowly and suffered from a lack of sophistication compared with the elite European institutions. Indeed, that is probably why almost none of the significant scholarship on the GAJ from the 1800s and the 1900s came from North America, as will be shown below. Thanks to the Enlightenment, the Christian scriptures were open to, de, uh, to uh, analysis apart from the tradition. And now that there was no predetermined difference in historical value between the canonical and non-canonical literature, the apocryphal sources enjoyed greater attention and even gained a new status as a counter-canon. Because the study of the GAJ was part of that wider body of scholarship, it was also influenced by it. Early Christians, uh, excuse me, early experts considered this text particularly important because of its clear connections to the canonical Gospel of John. All of these inquiries reflected a common principle behind the earlier Enlightenment movement. Scholars should not assume that the Bible, and by consequence the fourth gospel and later biblical interpreters, preserved a mirror image of the past as it truly was. Rather, inquirers should examine as many of the relevant sources as possible and construct a history without privileging any of the sources a priori. Unlike the bishops in the 8th century, these modern scholars purported not to judge the GAJ by the fourth gospel. Instead, they compared the two gospels side by side and wrote histories based on their own judgments. This is not to say that all of the scholars surveyed here were absolutely skeptical of tradition. The point here is that the Enlightenment movement compelled experts of early Christian literature to defend their views by appealing to empirical and historical evidence. The Bible itself and later tradition no longer sufficed. Thus, even though some, if not most, of the historians covered below show explicit or implicit commitments to the Christian faith, they had to adopt the new rules in order to be taken seriously. The first order of business was to build a critical edition of the GAJ and compare it to the recent critical editions of the New Testament. Greek editions of the canonical corpus had existed since the, Re since the Renaissance period, thanks to scholars like Desiderius Erasmus and the later Constantine von Tischendorf. What motivated these two scholars to create critical editions in the first place? Well, Erasmus's motivations presumably lay in the context of the Renaissance humanist movement. Tischendorf, however, lived in the immediate context of the Enlightenment. And although he had no desire to replace the historical narratives of the, uh, the, of the New Testament or, uh, or scripture with an alternative scholarly reconstruction, Tischendorf sought out the earliest manuscripts in order to demonstrate the reliability of the Bible by the standards of the Enlightenment that had birthed this uh, historical criticism, or higher criticism as, it, as it's called. And uh, by this time, higher criticism had developed much further than the, uh, the early version that Spinoza had developed. The same text-critical work needed to be done for the apocryphal texts like the Acts of John, despite the fact that it took scholars much longer to get around to it. To achieve that goal, Theodor Zahn published Acta Johannes in 1880, although his edition did not complain the complete GAJ. The full gospel portion was absent because historians did not have easy access to the only surviving copy of it, and that copy was located at Vienna and was, evidently, draped in obscurity. After all, if Zahn had been able to access it, then he probably would have included it in his edition. That same manuscript is still in Vienna today. It is part of the Codex Vindabonensis Historicus Graecus 63, spanning from pages 51 verso to 55 verso, and it's dated to 1319. I happen to have another video about it, and if you're interested, you can find it on my channel. Despite the admirable preservation of the GAJ in Austria, historians only knew about the quotations of it recorded in the documents of the Second Council of Nicaea. M. R. James, a famous British antiquarian, learned about his, this complete copy uh, by 1886, but he was only able to acquire a transcript and publish the Greek text with a parallel English translation in 1897. His translation was part of the volume, or shall I say the second volume, of his series called the Apocrypha Anecdota. He made no small matter of the newly published gospel material. According to him, quote, the fragment of the Acts of St. John the Evangelist, which is now for the first time printed, is of very great importance for the light which it throws upon the docetic view of our Lord's person. 
end quote. Like Tischendorf, James's writing responded to the historical questions highlighted by the Enlightenment legacy. Yet whereas Tischendorf strove to give textual and historical evidence for the accurate transmission of the New Testament, James focused on the comparative inferiority of the early Christian Apocrypha. In James's view, a comparison of the canonical documents with the non-canonical documents would indicate to any unprejudiced reader that the former were better sources. In other words, the New Testament wins. Uh, for instance, in the first volume of his Apocrypha Anecdota, James presented his opinion of the non-canonical works in no uncertain terms. Quote, It is plain to be seen that most of the books are very badly written, some of them very savage and horrible, all of them most obviously unhistorical, end quote. James did not make this comment in the context of a comparison with scripture, of course, but both his tone and his ever-present reverence for orthodoxy suggests his loyalty toward the New Testament over texts like the GAJ. Additionally, his biographical information would support the idea. He grew up in a pious Anglican household, and as an adult, he opposed the appointment of an agnostic, Thomas Henry Huxley, to a post at a school that he was already affiliated with. Following James's dissemination of the GAJ, there arrived a more robust edition of the entire Acts of John in R. A. Lipsius and Max Bonnet's Acta Apostolorum Apocrypha. This was a publication project that spanned from 1891 to 1903, and more importantly, it included the GAJ. Thanks to James, Lipsius, and Bonnet, scholars could now see that the GAJ contained an alternative narration of events described in the canonical Johannine Gospel. Interest in the Acts of John increased along with the availability of better, better critical editions. The GAJ itself began to receive more attention than some of the other parts of the Acts of John, most likely because, as James wrote in 1924, that this section is, quote, perhaps the most interesting in the Acts, end quote. After making progress on the textual criticism of the GAJ, critics compared it to John's Gospel, uh, with which there were many points of contact. Peter Corson's 1897 study was one of the first to do this. His work was a study of the history of monarchianism in the prologues of, to the four canonical gospels. Unlike James, who sweepingly viewed the entire early Christian apocrypha as spurious, Corson considered the possibility that the apocryphal books actually influenced some of the New Testament writings. If, th if this were true, then some of the apocrypha would have included earlier tradition than the canonical books. Corson thought that such was the case with John's gospel and the GAJ. To him, the idea that the GAJ depended on the fourth gospel is indefensible, because previous commentators like Zahn and Lipsius failed to demonstrate any conclusive evidence of dependence. In his view, the theory that the canonical gospel used the GAJ explained the evidence better. Similarly, in 1900, A. Hilgenfeld produced his own study of the text. Like Corson, he believed that the GAJ served as a source for John's gospel. However, their proposals did not take hold. Later scholars instead chose to see the GAJ as reliant on the canonical gospel. In this way, the scholarship in the first half of the 20th century reflected an interest in the kinds of historical questions emphasized during the Enlightenment. The second half of the century continued the trend, except perhaps for the fact that studies with connections to Christian apologetics, like those of Tischendorf uh, and James, began to leave the mainstream of the field. The publication of a book called Neutestamentlich uh, Apocryphen II in uh, uh, 1964 marked a large step in condensing the most recent progress on the New Testament Apocrypha up to that time. That work contained Knut Schafferdijk's influential introduction to the Acts of John, uh, and it included the GAJ portion. Rather than resolving the intertextual issues between the GAJ and John's Gospel, Shefferdeek focused more on, pro on the proper location of the GAJ within the wider narrative of the Acts of John. When the GAJ was rediscovered, critics like Lipsius and Bonnet placed it after the episode of Drusiana and Callimachus, giving it the section numbers 87 through 105, which is out of the total number of 115 sections for the complete Acts of John. Shefferdeek, however, disputed this placement. In his view, the GAJ belonged between sections 36 and 37, and subsequent historians have followed his arguments with only a couple of exceptions. He, uh, he also attempted to place the GAJ among the known forms of early Christianity, asserting that it was clearly a Gnostic gospel with some affinities with an early form of Valentinianism. Almost 20 years later, 
Another major contribution to the literature on the GAJ appeared in Eric Junod and John Daniel Kiesley's 1983 book, Acta Johannes, which served both as a thoroughly updated critical edition and as a new commentary on the entire text. Like Shefferdeek, they did not focus on the relationship between the GAJ and the Fourth Gospel. Uh, their source critical focus was on the multi-layered nature of the GAJ. To them, the text was a composite document. Sections 94 through 102 were interpolations, leaving sections 87 through 103 as the core of the earlier GAJ. This also affected their interpretation of the GAJ and the Acts of John as a whole. The only clearly Gnostic portion in their view was that later redaction. Thus, the Acts of John was not Gnostic at an earlier time, but the interpolation added a layer of Gnosticism to it at a, at a later time. In 1992, Richard Purvo shifted some of the discussion of the GAJ back to its relationship with John's Gospel in his article, Johannine Trajectories in the Acts of John. After giving a short summary of previous positions on different questions, including those listed above, Purvo surveyed the text looking uh, for any interaction with the content or themes of the Gospel of John. In his view, the Acts of John, and especially the GAJ, demonstrate the existence of alternative interpretations of John's Gospel. He goes on to state the implications of this idea for the study of Johannine Christianity. Quote, More importantly, the Acts of John exhibit the ongoing work of at least two Johannine schools or circles that concentrated upon a basic core of Johannine expressions and resolutely applied them to the tradition as a whole. Investigation of the community of the beloved disciple might well take into account the communities visible in such texts of later Johannism as these acts. For the focus of this study, Pervo also makes an important remark that is worth highlighting. Quote, the object of this study is to pursue ways in which the document seems to reflect the Johannine textual trajectory, to explore the Acts of John as an interpretation of the fourth gospel, as one reading of its text in comparison with the better known orthodox readings and without intentional prejudice toward either. End quote. Here, Purva has clearly inherited the Enlightenment ideal of impartiality, an ideal of secure knowledge, independent of religious tradition. Despite that ideal, Purva's article reflected intellectual movements that were becoming more common in the year 1992, but not, for instance, in the year 1892, which was a time closer to the immediate uh, aftermath of the Enlightenment. This reflection was, it, was his admission that he had no intentional prejudice toward orthodox or alternative interpretations. In other words, he strove for impartiality while realizing that some partiality on his part was possible, if not inevitable. That admission may be related to the postmodern critiques in academia in the second half of the 1900s, which stressed the impossibility of unbiased narratives about the world, including narratives about the past. Pervo tended to separate religious and theological questions, despite understanding that one could influence the other in a scholar's mind. His own life reflected the separation but coexistence. While working as a professor at Seabury Western Theological Seminary, he was also an Episcopal priest. Additionally, he was a fellow at the Westar Institute, which is the housing place of the famous Jesus Seminar founded by Robert Funk. The Westar Institute is not well known as a, excuse me, it is well known as a bastion of strict historical criticism. Its website includes a strong statement about its quest for meaning not cloaked in dogma, for truth not based on authority, and for religious scholarship free from biblical literalism and the academy. The tone of the statement makes no effort to hide the obvious influence of the Enlightenment ideal, which stressed the hard separation between dogmatic tradition and historical inquiry. It seems uh, to echo Kant's 1784 exclamation, quote, have courage to make use of your own understanding, end quote. Just as Kant called for understanding that is not fed from the outside, so does the Westar Institute strive to be independent of religious tradition. Because Pervo was a fellow of the Westar Institute, it, almost certain, it is almost certainly the case that he held similar ideals, even if he was capable of maintaining a degree of modesty about his scholarly conclusions. Finally, the last great study of the GAJ in the 20th century was Lalleman's 1998 monograph entitled The Acts of John. Lalleman produced a large synthesis that drew upon the studies uh, uh, mentioned, you know, all the studies mentioned above. His contribution was to build upon the work of Junod Kessley, Shefferdeek, and others while parting ways with them on some of the historical questions. His main argument was that the Acts of John, in the earliest substantive form as scholars had reconstructed it, 
functioned as a two-stage initiation into a Johannine form of Gnosticism. The text functioned uh, to invite people into the Christian fold and then give uh, them an initiation into the deeper mysteries of Christ. Regarding the GAJ itself, Lalleman seems mostly to follow Purville's line of thought and gives some attention to the intertextual relations between the GAJ and the Gospel of John. However, he did not take a firm position on whether the GAJ had direct literary dependence on John's Gospel, but he also did not take Corson and Hilgensfeld's view that John depended on the GAJ. More to the issue at hand, how would a study even as late as 1998 betray a connection to the Enlightenment era? While the exclusively historical focus of Lalleman's work suggests this, there is also some information to be gained from a knowledge of Lalleman's background. The back cover of his book indicates that he studied theology before attending graduate school to write the dissertation that became the aforementioned book. Uh, uh, and it indicates that he is an ordained Baptist minister. Academia.edu also lists him as a faculty member at Spurgeon's College in London. Such details about him, and particularly those in his monograph, are included as if they are incidental to his work as a historian. Such a perspective did not exist before the Enlightenment movement, where, of course, it certainly mattered what your confessional stance was. That is not to say that Lollerman was, and is, entirely uninvolved in the connections between history and theology. On the contrary, he has regularly addressed is uh, such issues in his publications, and these publications are not strictly historical. For example, he has contributed multiple articles to the faith-based website Christian Today, with titles like, Is the Septuagint Inspired? and Research Only Confirms the Reliability of the Bible. But the careful distinction between history and theology in his writing is a testament to his place in post-Enlightenment scholarship. Even though his theological positions somewhat align with those of the 19th century scholar Tischendorf and the 20th century antiquarian James, Lalleman went further than they did to distinguish between uh, the disciplines of history and theology. What appears to be the arbitrary secularization of early Christian historiography seems to indicate the intellectual stakes at hand. The field has been controlled by those who are the most secular or left-wing in their scholarship. Indeed, it is almost a maxim that scholars will read everyone to the left of themselves, but never those to the right of themselves. Are Christians like Pervo and Lalleman trying to make sure that they will also be read? Is the imperative to maintain credibility a major factor in how scholars present their work? Uh, this little study does not attempt to offer any uh, prescriptions for the current state of the field, but it is important to be aware of the conditions under which biblical historians are constrained. Some may point out that the secularization of biblical studies based on Enlightenment principles, rather than sidestepping confessionalism, simply enforces a new confession to be adopted by all scholars, regardless of their theological persuasions. And if the reality is that a new confession has replaced the old, then the goal of the Enlightenment probably has not been achieved. The present paper has attempted to show that the scholarship of the GAJ in the 19th and 20th centuries reflected the focus on, histor uh, on history established during the Enlightenment period. The essay began by giving a brief survey of the most relevant Enlightenment era themes and thinkers that impacted, either directly or indirectly, the later study of religion and religious history. These included such philosophers and historians as Kant, Strauss, and Runke, who set up the philosophical and historical foundations that would later inform scholarship on the Acts of John. Then the project compiled a literature review of the most important studies of the Acts of John and the GAJ from the 1800s and the 1900s, with attention to how the interests of the scholars reflected the historical concerns of the Enlightenment and what some viewed as its theological implications. Scholars like Tischendorf, James, and Lalleman more explicitly related their historical work to theology, whereas other scholars more subtly inherited the historical interests spurred on by the Age of Reason without attempting to use those interests or uh, to, uh, to attack or defend Christian faith. Not all the scholars uh, cited here attempted to use the GAJ as a means to challenge traditional Christian readings of church history, but all of them focused on historical value as the primary means whereby a text was judged. Why does this matter? Well, it shows that the Enlightenment movement has shaped scholarship for about 300 years, and as of now, there is no reason to think that it will cease to do so. The first decades of the 21st century have seen more scholarship on the Acts of John and the GAJ, with much more of it coming from the United States. The historical critical questions remain the most important issues among scholars, but fields like reception history and literary criticism have become more common. 
Additionally, the discussion of whether the apocryphal texts are inferior sources compared with the New Testament regarding the history of Jesus and the early church continue to lose interest as scholars increasingly focus on how all of early Christian literary productions represent diverse movements among different groups of believers. In short, the Enlightenment impact remains, but the way in which the impact is applied continuously shifts as new questions become interesting to scholars. Perhaps one of the best assessments of the current state of post-Enlightenment uh, scholarship is to be credited to Raymond Brown. In 1966, he wrote, quote, Scholarship cannot return to pre-critical days, nor should it ever be embarrassed by the fact that it learns through mistakes, end quote. He originally said this in the context of a major shift in Johannine studies in which John's Gospel was no longer seen as a Gnostic writing. But the point of his statement is of equal relevance here. And despite having penned that statement nearly 60 years before the writing of this little study, his words apply equally well to the situation of how current scholarship can acknowledge the progress of past accomplishments, but still remain open to continual improvement. The hope of the present author is that regardless of where external theoretical orientations may drive scholars' interests, there will always be the hunger for improvement and the willingness to learn from mistakes.